here we go. So I'm going to kick off with, I've got a couple of questions that have come in from our virtual attendees, and we'll start with those, and then we'll open the floor up to the room um, for live questions. Um, so first question is, um, I'm, I'm a 28-year-old, I'm going to, to paraphrase this because it's pretty long, a 28-year-old who lives in Croatia, and she says that for the last 12 years, I've been walking from doctor to doctor, and every time I'm hospitalized, I try to explain my condition. In my country, Croatia, very few doctors know about CP2. In the last 10 months, I've been hospitalized three times, and it's been difficult to receive adequate care. What do you recommend is the best thing for me to do to best prepare to find a doctor who can follow my care? So, 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 you, so you need to contact Dr. Ivo Baric, um, he's the metabolic specialist in, um, I forget which city he's in, but he's in, he's Cro he's in Croatia, um, and you need to get him to write you a, a, a protocol letter that explains what your disease is and what to do when you go to the hospital and be available um, to, uh, to, to go in and, uh, uh, and talk, to, talk to physicians on your behalf. Thank you, Dr. Rock. I'm sure that is way more than they expected. <laughs> I think the name is, is yeah, I think it's B-A-R-R-I-C with that little thing on the top, whatever that, whatever that is. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Buck. I appreciate that. Um, next question is, although it's not recommended for patients with FAODs to take statins, are there alternative recommended therapies? Anybody? <laughs> Going once. Going twice. This falls into the category of know what you know and don't go and, and don't talk about what you don't know. Um, uh, there, there, there are reports of, of a statin myopathy being more common. Um, and it's in CPT2. I don't know of anyone with any of the other diseases that, that, where that's been um, identified. However, um, the, the, uh, we, we, we typically recommend staying away from them. Um, and, and I say the same thing about, about hyperlipidemic drugs as I do about, about uh, antibiotics. I do not know what the most recent and up-to-date penicillin is. You've got to go to a specialist. Yeah. Anyone else have thoughts? Oh, that's it. Questions in the room? Okay. Um, my, my questions are actually coming from Hunter. He's just really shy. Um, he wanted to know, Dr. Bockley, what made you interested specifically in helping our community um, versus every other community you could have picked on? Not the short story or the long story? Um, I, be, be, because I work on these disorders, <coughs> excuse me, on a, on a research basis, um, it, it really only made sense to, 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 to start to start uh, working working with them on a, on a clinical basis. Uh, one of the reasons to do uh, combined uh, MD PhD is you get to see the patients in the clinic, um, identify needs, uh, think about things that you can do to help them, and then go in back into your research program and do that. Um, and and, uh, and, and, uh, and so I've, I've always pulled my research from my clinical experience uh, and, and, uh, and ultimately uh, I, I try to take it back to the clinic. Let, let's ask that question to all the panelists. Or, <coughs> what, what drew you to this community? Thank you. I like that question a lot. Um, so I've always been really interested in fatty acid metabolism. When I was in college, I was pre-med, and just fell in love with biochemistry, and I learned that you could become a metabolic dietitian. So I switched, and from college, I knew that I wanted to be a metabolic dietitian and study fatty acid oxidation disorders, uh, just because my, my love for fat metabolism, and yeah, I'll never leave. <laughs> 
<laughs> Dr. McGuire. Uh, probably something very similar. So biochemistry was something that always uh, made sense to me. I always, you know, it, it came relatively easy, I think, to me, just because of how my brain works. But I think the real thing that kind of inspired me was when I was uh, a medical fellow and taking care of um, a, a particular patient who had a mitochondrial disease, who came to clinic and was not looking too well. Um, you know, the, the parents wanted to take the child home. Um, we wanted to hospitalize the patient. The parents decided to take the, the child home and then had an incident in the, in the car on the way home. And this was due to an infection. So came back to the hospital and got to take care of this child during uh, this particular episode. And the child actually wound up passing away. Um, so that's something that always sticks with you. You know, should I have pushed harder? Should I have really you know, uh, insisted or, you know, you always question whether you've done the right thing or taken the right steps. Um, so it's it's really an incident like that that kind of motivates me for something that, you know, we used to, it, it, when you're in residency, you're trained not to call out sick, right? Um, for coughs, colds, or whatever, because that means someone else has to cover for you. So you're trained not to do that. Now, in COVID times, that's completely changed. But when I was training, you're not supposed to do that. Um, and it kind of stuck with me that something so simple that, you know, I didn't stay home for when I was doing my residency training could be so detrimental to these kids. They have this kind of underlying sensitivity for these infections. So that's a story that's always kind of stuck with me. Thank you for sharing that. Dr. Arnold? I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. I do have a follow up, but I'll let you guys go right. first. It was a total accident. <laughs> um, I thought I wanted to be a dysmorphologist, who is uh, someone who studies birth defects. But when I went looking for training programs after my pediatric residency, uh, there wasn't a lot of funding except for people who wanted to work in the lab. And I knew I didn't want to work in the lab. And so the program was actually funded by a now defunct federal grant to train metabolic doctors. And they said, well, you know, like, you'll still be boardable, and you, but you're just gonna have to step aside and take care of these metabolic patients too. But I got bit by the bug, um, and here I am. Where are you? Well. What inspired me to uh, go into social work? Uh, really would have to say my parents, uh, who were always uh, a very supportive in helping people in our community. I grew up in a very rural area, and um, so the community and your essential people in your network was uh, your, really your, your support team. And growing up on small farms, each uh, farmer had to depend on each other to help each other. So I think that was my foundation. What inspired me is it's ironic. Uh, uh, my background started out significantly in behavior health, and then it led into more into medical. But my main focus has always been to work with the whole family, um, and um, and I just have a passion to support and help families wherever they are. When they, whenever they come into care and, and uh, as they lead on to go on to be successful in their lives. With the many children uh, I've had the opportunity to work with, it's always good to hear back from them, to let me know what they're doing, whether they're working or uh, education, what's going on with them. So um, I think that's what inspired me to be a social worker. I, I, want, I want to follow up, but first of all, I have to, uh, Pam reminds me to blame my mother. Um, I, I, blame every, I blame everything on my mother. It's either genetics or environment, it's her fault. Um, but but uh, she told me not to go into medicine, so I, of course I had to. But, uh, back then I was an ordinary teenager. Um, I, I do want to tell one story, because this thing, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Arnold says, you know, life's what happens while you're making plans, is what she, what she was uh, hinting at. Uh, and and uh, when I was a first year pediatric resident, an intern, I, I, I started in the ICU at Children's Hospital in Denver where I did my residency. And the ICU was filled with kids who had something called Rye Syndrome. Um, and and uh, this is a condition where kids came in, suddenly they had uh, low blood sugar, high ammonia, and they were in coma. 
And there was this rash of it going around, and everybody's getting ready to start this big protocol to try to figure out what it was and how best to treat those patients. Um, I came back to the ICU two years later as a senior resident and supervisor, um, and, and, um, and Rye syndrome had disappeared. And the question was why? And, uh, and, and, it, and it turns out um, that, that uh, when I was a second year resident, MCAD deficiency was identified. And all those kids who had Rye syndrome in the ICU the year before turned out to have MCAD deficiency. And we knew how to treat them now, and they didn't show up in the ICU after that. Um, so um, it, it, it's, it's just amazing um, that, that, that you can have such a big impact um, on, on the outcome of a disease by just identifying that it exists. Um, and and, uh, and and now now I, I I really will show my age because none of these exist these diseases existed when I was in medical school. So these are all new things in in my career, and and uh, and, and look where we are. Um, so how can you ask anything more than that? You know you got to you got to do it. Dr. McGuire, I think you said something really important for our families to hear, and it was that you wonder whether you did the right thing. And I think it's really important for patients and families to not forget your human side and to know how every patient that you treat, every decision you make, how that personally impacts you and how much you truly care. So thank you for sharing that because I think we forget that sometimes. This question could be for everyone also. I'm going to steal your question, Stephanie, to Dr. Rockley right before we started. Um, how can we as parents communicate um, or help get, get studies funded? Um, a lot of the questions we've asked this weekend, the answer is we don't know, we haven't done the study yet. Um, so, so I would be interested to learn, like, what are you interested in studying and, and how can we help um, motivate those, the powers that be to come that? Um, if there, I mean, there are organizations, as we know, that you can donate to. Um, so honestly, I think the biggest barrier that I can think of would be funding. Um, so do donating to organizations such as um, our FAOD organization. Uh, but I'll let the person in the NIH speak more, <laughs> more about funding. Right. So there. So obviously there is funding that is um, comes from the community. So private funding from different organizations, like we've spoken about. But a large majority of the biomedical research enterprise in the United States comes from funding from the NIH. Um, so this is a process where investigators apply for a grant, um, which is then reviewed by um, a number of you know people, uh, hopefully in their field. Uh, and they score it basically, and then based on the score, you wind up getting funding or not getting funding. And some of these, some of these mechanisms can actually be renewed. Um, so what I've noticed from the mitochondrial disease community, which has been kind of successful, is they have, um, and, I, and I, to be honest, I'm not sure about this, and, and maybe Dr. Vaughn can speak about it for the for the FAO community, whether they have a um, um, an advocacy group in Washington. Okay, so they did. So, so I know that the UMDF has their advocacy group in Washington where they've actually pushed to have mitochondrial disorders actually bring it to the attention of Congress, where then Congress asks every couple of years, what's the United, uh, sorry, what is the NIH doing about mitochondrial disease? You know, how much funding, where is it going, what grants are being funded? So it's almost like a checkup on the NIH, essentially. Um, by this advocacy group or this, this political action group, essentially. Um, so that's what I've seen as far as the most successful in terms of um, holding a government agency accountable, which does um, essentially fund a, a large proportion of the biomedical enterprise. The, 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 the uh, UMDF was even um, successful in getting uh, a line item in the Department of Defense budget, of all things, uh, for uh, mitochondrial uh, respiratory chain, uh, well, for mitochondrial disease, 
And the good thing about not knowing what you're doing is when they wrote the, the, the bill that said mitochondrial disease, and they were being lobbied by a group that was interested in respiratory chain deficiency. But it turns out, of course, that fatty acid oxidation disorders are uh, mitochondrial disorders. And so we can apply for those, uh, for those grants. Um, uh, uh, and the, the, the advocacy is, 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 is really important. Um, and and one, of, one of the, the directions that, that Mito actually might want to think about um, is doing exactly what Dr. McGuire just said, which is um, start, start um, looking to try to um, uh, impact policy. And you start that by, by, by meeting with, with folks on the Hill who are, who are interested uh, and, and willing to, to pay attention to you. Um, I'd say contact your local representative or senator, but every time I do that, I get a form letter back, and it's you know kind of okay. So what? Uh, I don't I don't know how how uh, how efficient that uh, uh, that that is. I am plus minus on 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 saying raise money for research. You have to do a lot of bake sales to to, to raise enough money to be impactful. In, in the research world. I'd rather you see this, I'd rather see you spend that money on yourself. Go ahead and raise money, but do programs that help yourself, uh, and let us worry about the research funding. We'll get there. Um, uh, uh, but you could talk to your senator, that's okay. <laughs> so we just keep keep an eye out, because we, Mito Action has taken an increasing role in involvement in legislative advocacy. I think Stephanie's going to talk just really quickly before we close out about one of the projects that we're working on. Um, and so there'll be some opportunities for you to get involved. We have a couple of our team members that are on our state um, rare disease advisory councils. So we're working with other rare disease organizations within our states. Um, so there'll be lots of opportunities that we can get you involved with. So just reach out to us and let us know. Um, a couple more questions that came in from our virtual attendees. Um, so we're going back to the medical questions here. Can muscle weakness in an, in an adult be reversible? So I'll give you the, the background. I recently started in CT oil and have seen an improvement in muscle pain and stiffness, but not muscle weakness. <laughs> Sometimes, um, certainly there's a training effect where uh, the less muscles you use, the more you lose. And then if you can gradually start back to the point where you don't exercise so hard that you get in pain and, and stop doing it, um, you can help with that. Um, some changes, I feel some people respond well to supplements, some don't. Um, but in general, it, it just, you want a, a slow and gradual uh, exercise to try to build strength back. Okay, thank you for that. Um, next question is, is there any evidence of high blood pressure among FAMD patients? Short, short answer is I think no. Um, when, when, you're, when you're sick and in pain, your blood pressure is up. So if you look in the hospital, the, the, you might have um, uh, uh, records that show a slightly higher blood pressure, um, but I don't. I don't have um, anyone in my pediatric population um, who has um, problems with hypertension. Uh, I do take care of adults, and 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 you know, half of adults have hypertension to some extent as they get older. Uh, I wouldn't expect that to be any different in fatty acid oxidation disorders. Great, thank you. What is um, the what would be the recommended amount of liquid fluid intake or increase for an MCAT boy who is in full puberty and very active in sports? So is the question during activity how much fluid to increase? I, I think the question is prior to and during and after. You know, so the whole process there. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think it depends on a lot of things. I think it depends on the child's age, um, what activity it is. Um, it could also depend on what else is going on that day. I think it's pretty variable, and I hesitate to give a one number generalization. Um, I, I just think it depends. 
Yeah. But definitely more fluid during activity. Increase. Yeah, sorry, that's not a that's okay. answer. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be more specific. Yeah. Just, just because. I'll be more specific, just because I know people want real answers. Uh, well, uh, other, other than it, it, it is, it is uh, individualized. It is. Yes. Um, but, but one liter, two liters, or one liter. Um, so, so, so drink, so drink, a, drink, a, drink a liter beforehand. Have a couple while you're doing your action, your, your actual exercise uh, or activity, uh, and then, and then, and then take another one afterwards. Um, and, and uh, if it's a really hot day, you might even need to take uh, more than that. Um, this will all be recorded and online, right? That's correct. So our physical therapy lecture yesterday had some very, very nice recommendations about about uh, um, uh, fluid and and uh, electrolyte intake. Okay. Anyone else in the audience have a question? So this kind of goes back to the staffing question, and um, you all might have different input on this a little bit, but. Uh, in the last several months, I've met a lot of adult CPT2 patients who are struggling now with some of those things with like, I can't take a statin, but like I, you know, like I need to take something else, you know, so, so as like our kids are getting older and I recognize, you know, like as, as Christopher turns 20 and 30 and he has to go to these specialists and ask these questions and they just kind of look at him like, well, I don't know because I don't know anything about, you know, FAOD and then like the metabolic doctors like, like you can't talk to a specialist. I, I totally agree with you, Dr. Goffley. Like, you don't operate around condenses. You know, so it makes total sense. But, like, how do we, or, you know, how does, like, a patient kind of navigate that when they kind of keep getting flip-flopped between the two specialties? And or is it reasonable to have the two specialties communicating with each other? And, and what does that look like? Well, in an ideal world, we would communicate with each other. <laughs> In the real world, sometimes that can be hard to do um, with, between particularly adult services and those of us who are over in a pediatric hospital. Um, no, I, I think the communication is, is, the, is the key there. I, I, I was I was I was being flippant, and I didn't mean I would I would I would dump you to the to the to the winds and and and, uh, and, and leave you to your own devices on hypertension. Um, I, I do, in fact, speak to PCPs all the time. Um, and, and, um, uh, and, and, and so if, if there's a very specific question about a very specific kind of drug, um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll do that. Uh, most of the time I have to look it up because I don't, I don't know what, the, what those drugs are. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and then, you know, the next time around I'm, I'm okay uh, uh, talking to somebody about it. I do think we'll all get more comfortable with these as, as, we, as we have um, um, more, more and more um, uh, of, our, of our patients reach those, 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 adult, uh, uh, those adult diseases that, 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 that hit. Um, you all know by now, I, I like to tell stories, so, you know, during my, my, my residency, uh, my, 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 my genetics training, my fellowship, it was called back then, uh, we took care of a lot of adults because the, 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 the chief, the, the person that started our department, uh, and, and was now the was the, the dean of the medical school, was an internist, and so he had all these adult patients. Um, and and uh, and one night I get a phone call uh, from one of his patients saying, "I think I'm having a heart attack. What should I do?" And I said, "Call a doctor." You know. <laughs> uh, uh, it, 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 it's. Uh, um, it's interesting being in a specialty that's not age delimited, but having most of our early training experience um, as, as pediatricians, because the, the three of us, uh, you're pediatrician, right? So the three of us all came from pediatrics first and then went into genetics. So I'm much more comfortable, even if I still don't know what the, the, the I'm not, I'm not uh, up on all of the latest general pediatric literature, uh, I'm fundamentally way more comfortable dealing with a kid uh, than I am with, with a 60-year-old, even though I take care of 60-year-olds. So the other day, you told me I should probably find a new pediatrician. <laughs> You're not supposed to broadcast that line. <laughs> for someone who has TFP or something like that. 
So, uh, you're saying what would you look for in a pediatrician if you have an FAOD? <laughs> yes, like if I were to go so and talk to the other ones, like what am I looking for for them to like have? Because I'm just like, you're so smart, you're a doctor, I trust you, but honestly, um, so that's not always what I should do. Yeah, I mean, people are all different and pediatricians are all different. And some of them are more intellectually curious than others. And so often, um, often a smaller number of pediatricians ends up taking care of some of the more medically complex kids because it's, they're good at it, it's interesting to them, the families like them. Uh, one of the places to look, uh, the ARC, the Association for Retarded Citizens, sometimes will, uh, you can meet other parents there. Um, talk to other parents in your metabolic clinic. Um, you know, find out, kind of get work. You know, probably a referral from somebody else in the community about their doctor is a good way to find one. Uh, you know, fundamentally, what what you what you want is somebody who's who's um, willing to listen to you. I, I, I've said more than once uh, here. Um, uh, parents are always right, uh, and and and. Even when you're not, it's right to listen to you. Um, so, so we 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 have to we we have to your your pediatrician has to be able um, to to think about um, the, the the things that a pediatrician takes care of and separate them from the things that specifically require the fatty acid oxidation specialist. So you don't want your pediatrician to say. You've got a stuffy nose. You've got a you've got an ear infection. Oh, I think you might have a pneumonia. Go see your metabolic doc because it might cause metabolic problems. Yes, it might, but you got to treat the primary problem first. Go ahead and do that, and 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 in the meantime, give us a call. Um, uh, that that communication, especially when a kid. Is, is, is in the community or at, at, at home and and, uh, and you don't know what what what's what's going to happen now the other the other thing I'll caution you is that nine months is a really is a really tough age to take care of a kid with a severe disease um, anybody out there want to argue with me on that one uh, I mean, what, what are the, how do they have, what can they do to tell you that they don't feel well, right? They can get fussy, they can cry, they can, they can stop eating, all these things make you worry that they're having something really bad going on. So I do feel um, uh, some, some um, level of sympathy for your pediatrician who may have never seen one of these things. Has, has read the articles that people like us write and say, you know, the, here's, here's what happens with TFB deficiency, and they get scared. Um, but, but just like I can learn what statin uh, to, 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 to um, uh, say okay to versus, versus not, even though I don't treat um, uh, high cholesterol, your pediatrician can learn um, when, when they need to, to, to get uh, to get us involved. Um, I just had a comment about that, and then I have another separate question. Um, when my kids were diagnosed with the LCAD, it happened um, not with newborn screening, so it was a little different, but I went to my pediatrician and I just asked him, I said, are, are you able to manage this because there's a lot of moving parts, and I don't know if I'm good enough, basically, to keep track of everything, so are you going to be able to keep track of it? And he said yes. And then I remember the first time we ever had a crisis, I called him first, and he wasn't the doctor on call, so I got an unknown doctor and said, I guess you should do whatever you think you should do. And so I went to, you know, I went to him the next time, and I said, this isn't good enough. Like, I, you said you could manage it, and you weren't there for me. And he said, well, here's my first result number. So I feel like you have to kind of give your pediatrician, if you like them as a person, the benefit of the doubt that they'll, you know, grow with you as a patient because you'll keep learning and they'll keep learning. You just have to be able to communicate with them what you want from them as a pediatrician. So now I don't call the pediatrician, I just call her geneticist because she's really great if we're ever like in a crisis and have questions. But um, my pediatrician every, you know, year when we go in there says, how's everything's going? How's their heart issues? How, like they do ask and keep up with it, but our main person is our geneticist. 
And then Kyra had the idea that if you say where you live, maybe somebody else in the community has a suggestion of a pediatrician. I live in Northern Kentucky, so I usually go to Cincinnati for all of his health needs. Anybody, anybody has a recommendation for a pediatrician in Cincinnati? Throw it in the chat and we'll share it. And then they, my question is... Yeah, I'm sorry, let me just uh, answer that. They, they should have um, a, 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 a group there uh, that is the equivalent of a, of a complex care um, uh, group where we, where they, uh, uh, a group of pediatricians affiliated with Cincinnati Children's Hospital um, that, that, that um, is, is, is used to coordinating um, uh, 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 multiple specialties and multiple modalities. In our institution, those individuals um, uh, are, are located at the hospital, but they collaborate, collaborate with community physicians, um, and and um, usually your ticket into the door for them, I think, is you have a G two, you qual you qualify. That's as because uh, and then and then you know everything else that, that goes on. So so um, uh, ask your metabolic doctor. Is there is, is there a pediatrician that they work with um, that that is is uh, uh, somebody that they, they they really like and would recommend to you. Yeah, the, the complex care clinic in Pittsburgh is, I think, very helpful um, because they just help you to organize your complex needs. Um, and so and a lot of the hospitals have those programs now. Okay, so my question was, as your kids get older, how often should you reevaluate what their diet looks like? Because my kids have, can eat 20 and 25 grams of fat a day, but they've been able to eat that much for a while, and I don't know at what point should they be reevaluating it so that they can eat more? Yeah, that's a great question. Typically, um, each time you come in for a clinic visit, whether it's every uh, three months, every six months, your team and your dietitian should be evaluating where you're at now based on um, based on your laboratory values, based on how your kids are doing. How can we liberalize the diet a little bit to make it so that as they get older, their grams of fat should increase. It shouldn't stay the same as it was when they were five years old as, um, as they get older. And, you know, if they end up being 15 years old, they should be able to tolerate uh, more grams of fat, but it all depends on their symptoms, their laboratory values, but in general it should increase uh, when you go to your clinic visits. Thank you. Um, this question is for Pam. You mentioned um, educational advocates and the hospital, and I just was wondering if you could share a little bit more about what they do, like do they do they help educate parents, do they help educate the kids, and like how do you get in contact with them in the hospital, can you ever request them through your pediatrician? I've never heard of that before, so I was just curious if you could expand on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, in the hospital they may be called um, uh, hospital-based teachers, or they, be, or they may be referred to as an education advocate, um, in the system I'm in, they're called education advocates. So in the hospital, you can utilize them. If the child's going to be in the hospital, they coordinate uh, care as far as educational goals or uh, related to the school. If they need a 504 or IEP or recommendations from the uh, medical team, they can coordinate that with the school. In outpatient, we have education advocate that actually can help with um, anything that sometimes communication with the school and the family and the patient to advocate based on their education goals and also if there's a question related to uh, civil rights, related to um, access and being uh, having accessibility and also the school following the F uh, 504 and IEP plan. Um, so education advocate can, is really to help the family ne negotiate with the education system. Um, so they do work with the parents directly to help them. Um, you also can look in your, um, 
Med, uh, your medical team, uh, I know with working with endocrinology, we have a nurse educator that actually, for high-risk patients, that are high-risk related to their diabetes, that she communicates and goes into the school and directly works with the school directly, with the permission of the family, of course, uh, to help educate and make sure that there is compliance with that 504 plan. Uh, also, a lot of the school nurses don't understand uh, diabetes and maybe other medical conditions that you all may be familiar with that. We sort of have to have someone to educate them. Um, so that's what an education advocate is. Um, in our system, so I mean, other people that's in other systems may speak to that, but uh, a lot of times, if your child's in the hospital for a short term, they may not make a referral. But you can always ask, again, anybody on your medical team, I would like to speak to the education advocate in this hospital about that. Uh, or if you're an outpatient getting any kind of care, I know at Children's, at Neurology, anybody, you can utilize the education advocate for schools, services. Thank you. Um, a question that came in from our virtual attendees. For borderline carnitine levels just below normal in a CPT2 patient, is it necessary to supplement with low carnitine or is there an alternative way to help supplement the diet? Dr. Arnold? Start. Um, if this was CPT2, you CPT2, said? CPT2, yes. The use of carnitine in, in longer chain fatty acid oxidation disorders um, can bring physicians to fist fights. Um, <laughs> because we don't have all the data yet. Um, I don't like to see carnitine levels go below the normal range, and I don't think you do either, do you? I'm 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 more I'm more liberal. Uh, I don't like to see them go uh, free carnitine now. Uh, the carnitine that's available to bind up um, uh, the, the 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 fat as it's activated in the cell. I don't like to see it go uh, into the single digits. Normal is kind of twenty-ish uh, or, or between twenty and thirty. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of patients out there with, uh, who are carriers of a carnitine transporter defect, one of the things, one of the disorders, I actually haven't talked anything about here at this meeting, um, but it, it brings the carnitine into the cell. Um, and those individuals can have uh, of, of carnitine levels of, of, of uh, uh, down even into the low uh, teens, and, and they don't have any problems whatsoever. Um, so. So I, I tend not to supplement until I have either mu uh, true muscle weakness, something that I can, I can objectively um, uh, uh, see on, it, on exam, or it goes down into the, into the, single, uh, the single digits. Um, when I supplement, I supplement with a lower dose than we use with most, uh, some of our other disorders. So some of our disorders, we, we, we go up to, uh, well, that carnitine transporter defect I mentioned, we're up to 400 milligrams uh, per kilo. Uh, um, um, some of the other diseases, like propionic acidemia that I mentioned earlier, we use 100 milligrams. For fatty acid oxidation defects, I use somewhere between 25 and 50, and I top it out at 1,000 uh, milligrams. There's some theoretical concerns that um, high levels of, of long-chain acylcarnitines can be harmful to the heart, uh, that it can cause arrhythmias. It's never been proven. <coughs> it's one of the reasons that Dr. Arnold said uh, physicians who take care of these patients fight. Um, because for, for folks who think that, that, that having a low carnitine level is bad, you supplement, uh, and then you get into trouble with, for, with the people who think that the high acylcarnitine levels are bad. Um, the fact that there's no right answer um, tells you that we just don't know. Um, and, 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 and so I, I try to take a, a cautious approach. Um, I, I'll, I'll let you drift down. Uh, if I need to, to supplement you a little bit, I will do it with um, modest amounts rather than the mega amounts that we use otherwise. Okay, great. Thank you for that. And I'll just add that yeah. uh, carnitine is found in animal products. It, I'm sorry, so animal, animal products. products. Animal products. So if they wanted to try to increase carnitine with uh, a lean meat, that could work too, to avoid supplementation. 
Okay, great, thank you. The next question is from a GA2 mom, and the question is, what is a good indicator to determine that my child might need a liver transplant? This child has um, liver enzymes recently from his normal range to upper mid-200 range, and his liver is enlarged. G A two. It's a very, it's a very complicated question, um, and I'm going to dodge it yeah. um, because because uh, it's it's really medically complicated. Um, we, we do not typically transplant G A two patients. Um, uh, I've only ever done it once in my entire career, and it's the only one I ever know that I know about in in the in the world. Um, and it was under extreme circumstances. Certainly liver enzymes of 200, if, if they're really liver enzymes, remember they can, the, the things that we call liver enzymes can come from muscle. So every time your CPK goes up, your liver, what, what, what people call liver enzymes, will also be up. But it's not coming from the liver, it's coming from the muscle. Um, so so uh, you, need to, you need to talk to your metabolic doctors um, <coughs> about that. Um, and probably not so much about um, uh, 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 liver transplant plant yet, but if your liver enzymes are truly going up um, and in, in isolation of everything else that's going on, then you need to think about something else. Remember the stories from yesterday. What if it's not my FAOD? Thank you, for Dr. Buckley, for that. Okay, we've got an eight, another ADEM question. <laughs> okay, the question is, is there any possible correlation between CPT2 and ADEM? And what? ADEM, it is acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. So, so the short answer is no. There's, there's no existing evidence at this point to suggest that the two are associated. Okay, great, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? This before in years past, but um, can you talk about the reason why maybe sometimes our kiddos will present pretty well? I mean, maybe illness or something, but they're still eating and going to get checked, CKs through the roof, versus other times when they are looking very, very bad, not eating, vomiting, all of that, and the CKs won't be nearly as high. And I guess a follow-up question of that, what's the, I mean, it's the most important thing, how they present? Because I know a lot of times when we're in the hospital, our departure is based on like how low the CKs get or they're trending down, but maybe they're presenting well, but we're still there because we're waiting for CKs to get to a certain level. Does that make sense, my question? Yeah, it, it's, it, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase it to say, why, why don't the biochemical markers always match what we see? Right. Um, and, and, and all I can say is, is um, we see this. Uh, it, it, I, I, your, number, your number one concern is always the way the patient looks. Um, and the biochemical markers are there to help us. Um, people ask me all the time, well, what level of CPK would I admit to the hospital? And the answer is it depends. I have patients who I will admit when, they, when it goes to 5,000. I have patients that I treat as an outpatient with 50,000. And the reverse question is when we discharge is exactly the same. It depends. Um, if it was 200,000 and now it's 20,000, that's probably pretty good. You can go home if you're, if you're eating well and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and your symptoms are better. Uh, it's it's it, you, you, you've shown us you're, you're dropping at at the at, at the right rate. Um, if you were in the situation that, that you described first, that you look really terrible, but your numbers aren't so bad, um, then then I'm not going to make a decision on the number at all. So if it was five thousand when you went in, but you looked lousy, I'm going to wait until you look better. And then if if your if your CPK is still uh, 4,500, I'm not going to make too much of a, uh, a, 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 an issue over it. Thank you. And, and even within one program, there can be variability in comfort level among different providers. So, you know, one, one doctor in the practice may be, you know, I have a rule, you don't go home until it's 5,000. Another one may be, you know, oh, look, look how fast it's coming down. You're clearly clearing it. We're, 
we're, we're good, let's go. Um, and also, who's comfortable with home management? Um, so it sometimes, sometimes it's it's the doctors who who have some variability. Our, our conversations at clinic conference are are, are, are always interesting. Um, uh, uh, inevitably, they go something like, "You let them go home at what level?" <laughs> <laughs> Mom wanted to. I mean, it was okay. <laughs> I have a question about um, general anesthesia. In the past, I've heard there's certain meds to stay away from. I heard that some of the um, inhalation gases can cause rhabdo, and then propofol, I think, has lipids in it. Um, and I guess same for you know, moderate sedation. I mean, no upcoming surgeries. Jake's used propofol successfully several times, but um, I've heard mixed reviews and didn't know what the latest and greatest was on that. I, I, I wrestle with this question, and, and, and as with most, we don't have a, a hard and fast answer. I, I, used, to, I used to say, take malignant, malignant hyperthermia uh, precautions, um, and that eliminates one class of anesthetic agents. And then I would say, and, and don't use propofol, and my, and, my, and my anesthesiologist would do this, and they say, but you're, you, you're, I can't, and there's nothing I can use uh, if you tell me that. Um, and, 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 and so we've had this conversation fairly frequently with them, and, 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 I, and I say, okay, you tell me how you want me to handle this. They say, first of all, give me data. Show me that something is unequivocally bad and I'll avoid it and I'll do whatever I need to avoid it. Um, however, if you think it might be bad, and I tell you that it's going to be much worse if I use this other anesthesia, then, 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 they would rather use the, 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 the preferred anesthesia uh, because they know there's a risk to go to the, to the, um, the, the second tier. Um, so I have pulled um, way back on, 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 on what I say to uh, anesthesiologists these days. First of all, I don't really think there's a risk for, for malignant hyperthermia in, in, in these disorders. Um, and and um, uh, Myopathies tend to have a higher risk for malignant hyperthermia. And so if you have a myopathy secondary to a fatty acid oxidation defect, does that put you in that category? And I don't think we have data to answer that question. Yeah. Now, propofol is a fact. But, um, uh, and, and so what's, what's, what's the risk there? The risk is that it's metabolized differently in a fatty acid oxidation patient than in, a, in a, um, uh, somebody who doesn't have one of those. So what, what does that mean? Well, it could either mean um, that, that um, they overdose you. And, and in that case, um, we just wait longer for you to wake up. Now, in the mitochondrial respiratory chain community, there's a, there's a much stronger uh, 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 experience that says propofol probably, um, at, at the very least, needs to be modified, reduced, that, right. that, and, and, as opposed to specifically um, avoided. Though there are a lot of a lot of mito docs who say just avoid it because they don't want to have to think about it. They don't want to have to risk it. Um, uh, there, there, there are um, other options, um, and, uh, and and I just I just had um, uh, one of my patients have, have uh, uh, ankle surgery, and the and the the, 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 the anesthesiologist has batted it back and forth, and, and they came up with a with a, um, a there's a there's a published protocol using an alternative agent, and they used that, and it went just great. So my, my, my letter, uh, or my note now says, um, um, I, I don't mention malignant hyperthermia at all. I do say um, propofol is controversial. Um, it is a lipid-based uh, anesthetic, and, and, it, and, it, and it may require dose adjustment to be safely used in this disorder. If you can use um, uh, uh, another agent uh, without increasing the anesthetic risk, Please consider doing so. Period. Um, and, 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 and then it's then it's up to the anesthesiologist. Uh, if they are if, if they want me to be more specific, I'm happy to talk to them. And then I go through this long uh, uh, diatribe that I just did for you, um, uh, uh, and and leave it up to them uh, because 
They're, 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 uh, I, can, I can teach them about fat, uh, faster about fatty acid oxidation than they can teach me what I need to know about anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Hang on a second. Yeah. I was just going to make a comment on the propofol. So um, your dietitian can take that into account. Uh, propofol is 1.1 calories per mil, I think like 90% uh, fat. So if, let's say, your child got a certain amount in a 24-hour period, you can take that into consideration the next day, and your dietitian can let you know, oh, they got this many grams of fat in propofol. Let's adjust things. Um, so it can totally... Um, Okay, last call for questions. So before we close out for the panel, I'm just gonna throw it back to you guys and give you an opportunity to each just go from uh, right to left here and just give us last words of wisdom, encouragement that you'd like to share with, with our attendees today. Or are you gonna start? Let me start. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I just feel so honored to be here and uh, to be among all, all of these families and, and great minds. So I, I just have been having a blast and, and look forward to doing this again another time. Uh, yes, I, I would just like to say thank you to uh, inviting me and allowing me to you know, talk a little bit about what we do. I think what I was very struck uh, about and um, it was really the stories that a lot of families would share, a lot of personal stories. And I think that one of the things with the inborn errors of metabolism community um, that is a major strength is kind of the bonding that goes on at meetings like this, which uh, other families can serve as resources for, you know, how do I handle this? Where do I go for, for that? And a lot of online communication then uh, helps facilitate that. So. I think, you know, this is a really strong group, and I think, and, and I hope you continue to, to provide that great support that you've been providing for your current and new members. Uh, I, the, the, word, the word that came up today uh, that was uh, uh, exemplified across the whole meeting was communication. Um, uh, communication among yourselves, communication with your PCPs, communication with your metabolic dogs. Um, if, if you don't ask the question, you won't know the answer. Um, so, so never never hesitate to ask the question. If you don't understand something that's going on, um, always, um, always ask. Um, and, and then um, maybe my other part of the shot uh, is, is, is the, uh, my, my uh, a strong belief that five years from now, we're going to be having some very, very different conversations. That we're going to have a toolbox and not a tool um, to, to, to treat fatty acid oxidation disorders. Uh, and that can only be good because uh, uh, if you look at any other uh, common disease out there, uh, there are always multiple options to treat. And that's what we want. We want to be able to individualize uh, for, for, for every patient, um, pick the right drug, and if it doesn't work, we can try something else. We're going to be in that position pretty soon. Yeah, well, thank, thank you for inviting me. It's, it's very exciting for us to be here, as well as for you to be here, because we learn from you. We learn what your needs are. We learn what the unfulfilled um, agendas are that, that you need. Um, I learned a long time ago in medicine that if you don't listen to parents, you get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, and so it's really exciting to, to be here and to think about where we might want to take research in other places next. I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be able to participate in this conference. I did learn a lot and also an uh, opportunity to learn from the other medical professionals that are here. Um, I want to just uh, say yeah, communication is the key and also just to to reach out to others. If you don't know where to start, just start with the people you already have a relationship with and working with your child and ask them if they know of anyone else. Uh, any question you have is an important question. I always tell parents every question is an important question. You have the right to ask it. And I also say to parents, if you contact me and I'm not able to help you, or I'm not the person, it's not within my scope of practice to help you, 
then I will do my best to try to get you to the, pe the people or other ones that can best help you. So again, thank you, and I know y'all are working really hard to support and help your children. Great. Thank you all. Ron from Foster.